Willkommen, Jonvenu, and welcome back to Let's Learn the Electric Bass with Light. So previously, we did some episodes just introducing very fundamental basic concepts, and we're going to continue with that today. But a few things were mentioned down in the comments that I would like to address. The lighting situation. Sometimes I can record during the day, but most times it's going to be at night. So I'm going to have this overhead lighting. It is relatively harsh and it is slightly behind me. Can't do much about that, unfortunately. And so what you get over by this wall, what you get over my shoulder over there, there isn't much to be done about that until I either get a new room, a new lighting setup, or a better time to record. Also, my strings. Some people have noticed that they don't look all that great and shiny and whatnot. Well, they are old and they are in fact rusty. It's not a good situation and I am working on rectifying it. But one of my upcoming videos is going to be on strings, string types, and restringing. So this horror show down at the end will be no more. When this was originally strung, long time ago, it was not done well, and that could lead to tonal issues and slippage up in the tuning and all sorts of potential problems. So I will go through how to properly string it, why you string it certain ways, and that'll be a future episode. Also, some people have also commented on how strange the bass sounds. Now, there are a couple of things that might have caused that in those first couple episodes. Um, for one, I'm recording through one microphone. So Marshall here is putting out the sound. It's going into my microphone and it's being processed like a voice. So I haven't gotten to fine tune all of that to figure out a great way to do it. Eventually, I might want to move Marshall closer to the mic because it's right over here or the mic closer to Marshall or something, but I really want my voice to come through more so than the bass. So this time I turned the volume up such that more of it will get through my adaptive noise reduction. Because previously I had a fan on in the room because it was really warm and it had a low hum to it, which could interfere with the low hum of the bass. So if it sounds better this episode, please let me know. And I'm talking a lot here at the beginning because I'm not too worried about getting through today's content. Today's content, uh, wait, need to make sure everything was addressed from the comment section. Tone, strings, uh, lighting. I think that was it. This episode is on positioning. There are three things that are really seriously positioned that people think about, but there are a couple of other things that you might not think quite so much about. The fundamental rule to all of these positions is being able to do it while relaxed. If you cannot relax and be in a position, it is not the right position. Do you follow? Because everything you do needs to be relaxed. No matter how fast you're going, no matter what you're pressing, no matter how fast you're plucking, all of that has to be relaxed. You can't have tension in your shoulders, in your hands, in your back, in your throat, anywhere. Any tension is bad. It will lead to long-term lingering injuries because it won't be sudden. It'll just be one day you wake up and wonder, why everything hurts or why you can't flex your wrist more than 20 degrees. It'll be a long lingering thing that you don't even notice. So don't get into the habit. Don't be tense. Don't let anything get you tense. I know that's easy for me to say. Got a lot of patience. But for you, it's really important that you can be totally relaxed when doing this. Now, I'm not talking totally floppy relaxed, just no tension that builds over time. You should be able to hold this for hours without it freaking out. Okay? So let's get into the primary positions, and then we'll start talking about the other things that you might not necessarily think about. So first off, where do you put your axe? Because you have a lot of options. 
nigh on infinite options, really. The two major choices you need to make, major choices, are right leg or left leg. Seems simple enough, right? For these episodes, I've got it right leg, but left leg is a perfectly valid concern. Should you put it on the left and position the rest of it some other way? Well, let's look into the advantages of either one and some of the downfalls of either one. When you first pick up one of these instruments, you might be tempted to put it directly in front of you, parallel with your body, because our society loves things that are nice and clean and parallel, nice and clean and perpendicular, just generally nice and clean. Well, there's a problem here. When you're trying to do your fretting and you need to get up to the 12th fret, you're probably okay at the 12th fret, but look at where my arm is relative to my body. It's not going any further. So if I need to get up into any higher frets, oh geez, things go badly. Really bad. So 90 degrees, not 90, 180, completely parallel to you, right in front of you, is no good. So you're like, light, why not just push it out further? If you push it out further, then you can get up here no problem. Well, that's fine. You can now fret easily everywhere. But now this arm, uh, this arm, is really high up. I'm not sure I could hold it like this for another five minutes much less five hours. So we have a problem. That's not gonna work either. And if you were trying to stand up, well, that's gonna be a nightmare. So what you do instead is compromise. You like it out for your fretting hand. You like it in for your plucking hand. And so that's what you do. You put it in for your plucking hand where it's nice and comfortable. and you leave it out for your fretting hand, where it's nice and comfortable for the whole length of the neck. No tension trying to get anywhere on this. Follow? And for the sake of these videos, I turn myself about 45 degrees, such that it's flat to you, but I am not. So now we've got a nice position where we can get to everything. Now, 45 is just what's comfortable for me to be able to reach up here. If your arms aren't quite as long, this might be a stretch to get all the way up here. Because, I mean, you need this fret right here. You need to be able to reach here comfortably. For me, perfectly comfortable. For you, you might want it a little closer. Might bring it out only 30 degrees or 20 degrees. You need to know what's best for you. Your base might not be the same size as mine. Your arms are certainly not the same size as mine. So you want to find somewhere that you can reach right here and right here without any stress at all. Now that's right leg technique. That's one way of doing it. There might be other right leg techniques. If you have one, share it down in the comments. Next up, we're gonna to move to left leg. So we pick up our instrument, we shift ourselves, and we put it on our left leg. Now you might've seen classical guitarists playing this way. I personally really enjoy the way this feels. I really like Having this up here, I really like having the highest stuff right comfortably here. It feels really nice to me. Having my arm here resting at this angle instead of something slightly different and a little farther out, I like this a lot. I'm not going to be using it for these videos because it's difficult to record. It, it doesn't look as good in the camera. It's hard to keep it all visible in the camera. 
So I'm probably not going to be using this position for these videos, but it's perfectly good. You have good range of motion in your left hand. You have a nice and relaxed right hand. It's nice, comfortable, it's a good position. If you like this, if you can manage it, feel free to try it out. See how it feels to you because it might, again, might be too high up here. Your left shoulder gets all tired after a while. See how it feels to you. To me, could do this all day. But I'm not you. And that's going to be the moral of a lot of these videos is I can tell you what you need to find. But as a good scientist, you need to go out there and find it yourself. Because if you can't replicate my experience, if this doesn't feel good to you, then it's not the right position. So go out there, find what feels good. Keeping in mind, you need to stay relaxed and you need full range of motion. You need to be able to pluck down at the bridge. You need to be able to pluck up at the neck and you need to be able to pluck in the middle, but plucking in the middle is usually not a problem. You need to be able to get to this first fret and you need to be able to get to, I mean, the 12th is easy. You desperately need it. 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 20, 24. You might not need to get to 24. 24 is really high, but 20, not sure if that's 20, but you would need to be able to get up pretty high for serious high soloing type passages. So you want to make sure you can get to at least where your neck meets the body of your guitar comfortably. But alas, for these videos, right leg it is. Easier to record, easier to move forward and back for your viewing pleasure. So that's the axe. Now, positions for the hands. Let's scoot a little bit to the side so you can see the plucking hand. We're not going to go over plucking technique so much as plucking position. What you need is A, relaxation. You need to be able to do it all day. And B, free range of motion, like I said. But also, you need to think about where you can move your arm and hand from. Because when you get to slap bass technique, you need to be able to rotate from your elbow a uh, doorknob turning type motion. Shake, shake, shake. That's how you do the slapping. And so if your hand gets into a position where rotating it doesn't really work, that's not the right position. You need to keep your wrist relatively straight. It doesn't need to be perfectly straight, but it needs to be in a position where you could quickly get to that. From there, relaxed is best. You don't want to get all hook handed because this is tension. You can see that tension. You could probably feel that tension through the camera. Tension, no good. Relaxation gets nice curved fingers like you got a big old grapefruit in your hand. And then from there, you pluck, whether it's with your thumb or your first finger or your fourth, no matter what finger you're using. It's got to be nice, relaxed. Again, if you can't do it all day, you're probably doing it wrong. Except when it comes to the pads of your fingers. These round wound strings do a number on your fingers when you first start. They can cause blisters if you overdo it. You'll eventually build up a resistance to it. But at the beginning, it could cause some discomfort, and that is to be expected. So don't overdo it at the beginning. 
curved fingers, relatively straight wrist. Don't go all the way up, don't go all the way down. Good. Your other hand, follow the same rules. Do it all day, relatively relaxed, nice curved fingers. The only difference is your thumb. It's gonna stay on the back, right in the middle. Not up top, not on the bottom, not floating in the air, in the middle. Such that you can get up top and down the bottom. If it moves up and down a little, that's probably fine. But you don't want it to wander up because this will get you out of position and it'll get really weird when you try to do other things. You want your hand to be as free floating as possible such that you can move quickly all over the place. You don't want to squeeze with your thumb. If you start squeezing with your thumb, that'll bring in tension in your wrist in particular. So you just leave it there and you press with your fingers. If you need more oomph, you can pull with your arm, but in general, you shouldn't need more oomph than your fingers can provide. Now, I have some bad habits. I do sometimes let my thumb come up. It's no good. You got to keep it down. My pinky tends to fly away. Bad habit from my clarinet days. It's not supposed to fly away on there either. But for some reason, when I put tension on my ring finger, it makes my pinky want to go places, particularly right here. But don't beat yourself up over your bad habits. Recognize them and fix them. Odd psychological thing. It's much easier to fix things with a positive, keep your pinky near the string, than with a negative, don't let your pinky fly away. Saying, keep your pinky near the string, is much easier for your brain to interpret because there is one possibility for an outcome. You keep your pinky near the string. If you say, don't let your pinky fly away, there are millions of things that are not flying away. So it's harder to process, harder to internalize. So whenever possible, when trying to fix a behavior, be positive. Say what you should do, not what you shouldn't. So that's this hand, this hand, and the axe. Next up is mostly geared at people who plan on performing. Practice like you will perform, or at least as close as you can get. Bass players, when you're on a gig, you are standing. Notice how I'm sitting right now and not standing. Well, I don't have the room in the setup necessary for practicing standing up, and not everyone can get away with practicing standing up either. So what you do is you make your sitting position as similar to your standing position as possible. So right now, if I had a strap on, I could just stand right up and leave my base exactly where it is relative to my body. And then everything that I've learned in this position transfers directly. I don't have to relearn anything. All of the positions feel exactly the same because it is exactly the same, it's just my legs are extended. If you have a seriously different position when performing than when practicing, you're gonna have to learn everything twice, which is not bad, mind you, but it will slow you down. It'll keep you away from performing longer. And I want you to get out there with your friends as soon as you possibly can, because that's, that's really fun. Playing with other people is really fun. No matter how bad you are at it, it's great. So if you keep your practice similar to how you're going to perform, it'll get you out there quicker. And we'll cover why learning things multiple times is really good for you, but that's for the future. So that's how you keep it, how you hold it, where you position it. There are other positions though. Notice, my back, 
straight. You don't want to hunch over. It's no good. You'll eventually get all sorts of muscle issues by staying in that weird position. Keep your back straight. Keep standing up. It helps everything stay in line, and you can do it for much longer. So back straight. There is another reason to keep your back straight. For breathing. I know, this is an electric bass. No wind necessary, right? Well, when people get into a really intense passage, now I don't know any intense passages on the bass, so I can't give you a good example. But say you were doing Flight of the Bumblebee. It's really easy to get into the habit of when you're playing something really intense to hold your breath because you're focused so hard on getting exactly everything right. Breathe. You need to keep your breathing regular and deep, even when playing the bass, because you need to maintain that relaxation in your entire body, and breathing is the fastest way to get there. Even though you're not using your air for playing the bass, it's still important that you keep breathing. And that's probably the most counterintuitive thing I could possibly tell you about playing the electric bass, but it's true. You have to breathe and breathe regularly. Now, are there any positions that I didn't cover for you? Leave them down in the comments. If there are any that you don't really agree with or don't apply to other instruments, I would love to know because piano, it's the same way. Sit upright, keep breathing. All the wind instruments breathing, it's normal, but you might not be so focused on full range of motion and relaxation in your positioning, but it's still the case. Flute, clarinet, trumpet, trombone, especially trombone, you want that, that full range of motion. Some people are all about the wrist, some people are all about the elbow, some people about a combination of the two. Yeah, it's an important thing to think about. But for the bass, it's really straightforward. Hand, hand, fingers, fingers. Make sure you can get everywhere you need. Next episode, we'll be talking about intervals. Unless my strings arrive, like I get the strings ready to go, but most likely we're going to be working on intervals. That's going to be a two-part episode because we're going to cover the perfect intervals first and then the majors and minors after that. So that's two episodes worth of just interval training, figuring out what that is versus that versus that versus look at that pinky go. So we'll be working with those and I'll explain why they are more important than knowing the names of the notes on your fretboard. But that's next episode. I will see you in the next episode of Let's Learn the Electric Bass with Light. <laughs>